So uh, amazingly, I got a, there was a question in the Q&A while Anthony was speaking. I just kind of scrolled through them to make sure that there wasn't anything uh, immediate that, that we could answer. And uh, somebody had asked about bee houses. And I was like, hey, man, you're burying the lead. Uh, here we are. We're going to talk about a couple of types of outreach and education actions that I've come across a lot. And uh, again, just like Anthony mentioned in the nuances between honeybees and native bees and wild bees, there's a lot of nuances to bee houses. Um, so let's get into it. Let's talk about the, the benefits and the pitfalls of bee houses, the do's, uses, and don'ts. So bee houses can be a lot of fun. Um, they, but what we have to know is what they are for and what they are not for and what not to use as bee houses, what to look out for so you can make sure that the kind of bee house that you either purchase or make yourself is, uh, is good for the bees you're trying to help and what you need to do to maintain bee houses. Uh, this is something that I have consistently come across where folks just, they have a bee house that they'll purchase and then that bee house will never really get cleaned or maintained. And that, you know, there, there are elements there. Part of that is that perhaps the bee house you bought just didn't come with any kinds of instructions. Um, and that's part of what we're gonna talk about today as well is looking for the specific nuances when trying to either purchase or uh, create your own bee house. So most of you will be familiar with bee houses that come in all sorts of shapes and forms. Um, particularly artisan ones will, will just have like, you know, old scrap wood filled with pithy stems. And, you know, there's, there's a variation of types of, um, uh, you know, types of stems and types of materials used within the same house structure. Um, different sizes, diameters uh, of, of, the, of holes of nesting cavities, different lengths of nesting cavities, different colors, and so on. You can find them in all kinds of ways. But what we want to try to think about is why is it that we're trying to use bee houses? We're trying to use bee houses to provide more nesting habitat for our native bee species. We're trying to create bee houses to perhaps support pollination services in your neighborhood or in your farm or in your garden or in your yard or in your balcony. Maybe we want bee houses because they're particularly educational. They can engage uh, people of all backgrounds and ages. Um, they can be quite fun. Um, can they help in conservation? We'll come back to that question. When we're thinking about creating bee houses, we have to think about it from the perspective of bees. For us, they can be really fun and really engaging. We can, we can have a real intimate look, an in-depth look into the life cycle of pollinators, of bees, of these solitary creatures that are very hard to, to study or learn about otherwise. And they can be really impactful in public engagement because you can show people the different kinds of ways that people live. This is an example of a pop-up apiary uh, nesting habitat that showcased all kinds of different habitats for carpenter bees, for uh, uh, cellophane bees, mason bees, all in this one apiary that also showcased honeybee habitat just to show all the different kinds of ways that bees can live. And it's quite a powerful way to people, for people to be able to engage once again with this very secretive part of ecology that they wouldn't normally come across. And they can be really, really fun to engage youth, especially kids. They really love the ability to see the development of, uh, of these tiny, incredible uh, creatures that help make the world turn. But what we don't want to do with our bee houses is cause harm to the bees that we're trying to house. And that is in fact what bee houses can do if they're not properly designed, if they're not properly maintained, if they end up having pests get into them. If there isn't enough food around the bee house, um, if there are invasive species that take up residence in the bee house, and 
the idea that bees need bee houses and that they're somehow, again, a help in conservation is not actually, uh, we, we don't have good evidence to support that. And that's primarily because of this photo that I am sure you are all fairly familiar with at this stage, the life cycle of our mo common solitary bee species. These are non-ground nesting bee species. So starting with the adult, adult comes out in early spring, goes around foraging, gets prepared to create her nest. She uses all of her resources to lay these eggs, create her nest, provision them with uh, pollen and some food as much as she can. And then those larvae then complete their life cycles within hollow stems, pithy stems, and move on for the next generation. Slightly different from our ground nesting bees that do the whole situation that the, that the pithy stem nesting bees do or the cavity nesting bees do, but instead do it in an underground chamber. So the best way to be able to create habitat for both these kinds of bees is, well, you can just have a pile of bramble in your backyard and unmaintained space in a yard or a garden, and that will be creating bee habitat in a more effective and, co and, and cost managing way than the, the provision of bee houses or just leaving old standing stems, as we've covered a few times in the habitat creation modules, that stems, hollow logs, old rotting wood, all of these are incredibly uh, uh, valuable natural habitats that you don't have to go out of your way to create. And if you want a cleaner look, you can also just, you know, pile up your pithy stems or tie them up into little bundles to, to give them a bit more of an organized look. Um, but I still understand that a bee house can be a much more uh, in-depth engagement with bees. And for that reason, we want to make sure that we don't have any nesting cavity that is too shallow. You have to understand that bees have depth. And each species of bee has her own different preference of how far into a stem or how far into the ground she will decide to lay her eggs. And this is based on many different calculations, calculations of how much energy it might take to travel, calculations of the the most common predators of bees. And in many cases, those are birds. And, you know, in, in urban environments, you'll probably end up with like raccoons and things like that who have claws and ways to dig into spots. Um, and all of these different considerations will be taken into account by this tiny bee. And she de determines her depth based on this. And so if you have um, a bee house that has too shallow of a depth, you're making it very easy for predators to get in and get those larvae. You also don't want too many, uh, too many uh, cavities, because if you condense the population of these typically solitary creatures, not like honeybees, remember, the honeybees live in uh, giant colonies. These fellas are individuals that mostly live alone. You don't want to cram them into spaces because their ability to transfer disease and parasites to one another increases that, uh, that much. And too many is repeated here twice because it's just that important, okay? You don't want to have a jam-packed bee house. Um, it would be much better if you spread out many different bee houses over a larger space than if to you try to really fit a lot of bees into one space. You don't want, once again, the, the holes to be too wide for the same reasons as you don't want them to be too shallow, too easy for predators to get in. And also too wide means more sun exposure and the larvae and things might dry out. Um, you also don't want a bee house that's not secure. So this one that's currently hanging on the side of the shed looks like it's relatively secure. However, it doesn't have like a bottom part that also attaches. And so if the wind picks up or anybody bumps up against it, it'll just flop, you know, forward off of the wall. And so you want to make sure that when a bee house is, is being used, that it is not going to move. Um, and that's so you don't bother the bees. And also, you know, bothering bees usually means that they come out and yell at you.
and people get offended by that. So don't do it. Um, and you want to make sure that whatever bee house you have, you're able to clean. If you cannot clean the bee house, then it is not worth you buying it because an unclean bee house means the, the higher capacity to pass on parasites, pathogens, and not be able to create a healthy life cycle for bees in your environment. What you do want is for your depth to be at least 15 centimeters, and then you just leave it up to the bee to decide how deep she goes in, okay? Width of eight millimeters or less, that's very, very small. And that's because most of our solitary bees are very, very small. You want to make sure that it's extremely secure, that it doesn't easily come off of any of the uh, of your wall or wherever it is that you have, uh, have it. And again, crucially, you want it to be cleanable. So this is an example of a bee house that Dr. Laura Mirandon, who we've heard uh, in this series a couple of times, uh, created for her daughters to be able to engage with. And what she has here are uh, planks of two by four wood. Um, she created this herself. The, the paint job on the outside is just so... Uh, it's nice and bright and everybody can see it. Um, and the, the wood that she has used for the nesting cavities themselves is untreated wood. Um, and the inside looks like these just essentially trays. And she's doweled in with, with, uh, with a drill, these long holes that are at least 15 centimeters in depth. And you'll see that different bee species have decided to go at different depths. Um, in, in another photo that I'll show you, the mason bees go at a different depth, cellophane bees at different depth. Um, and there is a clear plastic covering on the outside so that you don't have to bother the bees really in order to be able to see um, their life cycle occurring with it right in front of your face. And this is a design that you can create yourself. Um, and there's enough airflow um, for, for there to not be uh, uh, ongoing parasite and pathogen uh, remnants. And finally, it's something that you can take apart and clean when needed. That's not to say that you have to make your own. There are many well-designed um, bee houses out there. The simplest ones are, uh, are these like uh, straw homes. Uh, I've made these just in my backyard with pithy stems. You just cut a bunch, cut them to nice even sizes and just tie them with a string. Uh, if you want to go and you know purchase one to to give to your friends and so on, Crown Bees uh, make some beautiful homes as well as uh, this design um, that uh, uh, that I will that is also from Crown Bees and is just essentially like these simple paper straws that achieve the exact same purpose and they're essentially single use bee houses. So you use them for one year and once the bees have gone, you essentially compost them. Whereas something like the Crown Bees House or the one that uh, Dr. Miranda designed, you can use year after year as long as you maintain them well. And so this is uh, one of the, the, the bee hotels that, um, that Dr. Miranda made. And you can see here the three different types of bees have taken up residence within one tray. At the very top, you've got leafcutter bees. and the uh, middle one, you've got cellophane bees. And the very bottom, you've got mason orchard bees. And you'll see that they all use different kinds of nesting materials. Mason orchard bees require more mud. Uh, the leaf cutters are using leaf pieces. And then the cellophane bees, they don't really have much in the way of, uh, of, of protection around their cocoons. They mostly just use their own, uh, uh, um, their own cocoon, cocoon creation uh, rather than uh, outside materials. You want to make sure that your bee house is located in a spot that provides the best possibility for bee success. You want to make sure that there's an overhang over top of the structure. And that's partially, again, to keep predators out. And just having that little bit of an extra shelf over top or a roof over top will keep you know, squirrels from being able to crawl in, or, or mostly it's raccoons. I've never really seen squirrels try to get in with the bee houses all that much. Uh, south facing, for the same reason that you want your plants to be in a south facing garden, sun exposure. Bees really like sun too. They uh, get activated by, um, by temperature cues. And so south facing bee house will give them a much longer chance of um, cat gathering food through the day. You wanna make sure that there's food provision around. This is crucial. 
if your bee house just happens to be in the middle of a of a park that has no see you know foreseeable native plants or even dandelions or clover uh that bee house isn't helping anybody and you want to make sure that there's some provision of food around there especially bee houses that are meant to be for solitary bees if you think back to the, the some of the first modules we learned about the different ranges of native bees some solitary bees only go a few meters from where they emerge in the spring and so if there's no food right around there there might be a house but they're not going to end up living in it um, mud as i just showed in the previous photo uh, a lot of uh, ground nesting bees and solitary bees use mud to create their habitat so having some kind of exposed soil is very important and once again, making sure that the bee house is secured and it's not going to fall. Last but not least is your maintenance piece. You need to be able to remove and clean the cocoons and the house. So this is the same bee house uh, that uh, Dr. Miranda designed, and this is her daughter here cleaning out the old cocoons of the bees. So this is after the bees have left. This is in the fall when you know that everybody is gone. They've completed their life cycles. You pull it out, you scrape out all the cocoons, you can maybe take some photos and see, you know, maybe some bees didn't make it and so on. Uh, and there's quite a few different methods on how to clean bee houses. The, the simplest one is, is to, to clean them in, in a dilute, diluted solution of bleach. Uh, I've heard of doing it in uh, acetic vinegar as well. Um, sand um, for scrubbing out some of the, uh, some of the finer particulates and so on. And there are many, many different uh, cleaning techniques, and I will share some resources for those uh, in the follow-up email. And as I said, this is an incredible opportunity to engage uh, people of all backgrounds and interests in seeing what bees actually look like when they start to emerge. Um, all of these little cocoons down here are live bees. <laughs> these are all bees that are gonna, that are gonna burst out at some point but right now they're just sleeping in there um and it's just really cool to be able to see them um under microscopes and so on this is one of the things that we want to avoid at all costs if you don't clean bee houses appropriately the uh the ability for parasites and pathogens to move amongst bee populations really increases and that is the last thing we want to do is add more pressure on native bees than there already is if you're maintaining a bee house that's in a community garden you know have like a cleaning party engage everybody it doesn't have to be a thing that just one person is responsible for it's like having a class gerbil you know everybody gets to take a turn taking care of it and really having that that ability to see the cocoons and share them with one another, like that, that's just really cool to be able to do. On a brief uh, view, this is your schedule for bee houses. And this will change by a few weeks for wherever you are in Canada and across the world. Um, but really early spring is when they ought to go out. Um, and uh, if you have cocoons from the previous year, um, if your bee houses, are, are ready to go out they can go out in the early spring in the spring you're just observing uh same thing all the way through uh through the summer into late summer you're really not doing anything you're just observing and in the fall is when you remove all the hollowed out cocoons and clean store um these are your directions you want to make sure that you clean them hang them on the south side make sure they're secure at least one meter above ground um if you decide to remove cocoons from the from the uh cases so that you can view them more personally uh you want to make sure that they're able to be stored in the right way um you make sure that there's resources around the bee house that you put out in early spring and that you do what you can to enjoy the pollinators that are going to come by and last but not least, I hope that when you go around trying to find a bee house, at the very least, you'll know what not to do. Even if you decide you don't want to have a bee house or bee homes aren't really part of your outreach or engagement activities, completely makes sense. But at the very least, you'll be able to know exactly what is wrong when you see a bee house like this one. Um, so this is your short checklist. 
This will be in your resources uh, next week, so you don't have to go through this entire talk. And I'm going to just take the last few minutes to talk to you about a second aspect of pollinator uh, outreach and engagement activities, and that is rearing butterflies. Very similar to the bee houses part, um, a lot of people very enthusiastic, very engaged. Uh, it is something that is quite cool, once again, to see a Lepidoptera complete its life cycle within, you know, right in front of your very eyes. Um, and you need arguably less material <laughs> to rear a Lepidoptera than you do for native bees. Um, and so, you know, popularly, the monarch butterfly has been one that has seen a lot of captive rearing. So everything that I'm going to share with you about the caveats of rearing butterflies is with monarch research in mind. And um, whereas creating bee houses for bees can be helpful in um, some circumstances, they're once again, not particularly a conservation action. The best action we can take is creating habitat. And the same goes here with rearing butterflies. They can both be very powerful educational tools though. So we wanna make sure that we use them educationally and not as conservation actions. So in terms of butterflies, the biggest issue is disease and fecundity. If you think that we don't understand bees, Man, we don't understand butterflies like a hundred times more. So um, in, in terms of monarchs, they are, as I said, the most researched of North American species. And so we know that they have a specific um, virus that they can pass um, from adult to larva. And if that is to occur, it can destroy entire populations. There are actually also legal concerns around the rearing of butterflies because this is, it, now you're getting into like active rearing and release of species um, that uh, is, that gets into permitting and, and uh, wildlife laws and wildlife activities. And those permitting requirements differ across the country. Um, you also wanna make sure that where you're doing this kind of rearing uh, is within the natural distribution of the species. If you start to rear monarchs in British Columbia, they don't really hang out around there. <laughs> uh, you start releasing that species in that region and you're starting to change the ecology and the biodiversity of that area. There's still so much that we do not know about Lepidoptera. So even with the most researched species, the monarch butterfly, we still don't know how they orient. So if you were to rear a monarch butterfly indoors and release it, there is some evidence to show they might not have the same orienting capacity that monarchs born in the wild do. And remember, monarchs take four generations to make their migration north to south. And that time, we have no idea how they decide which the right direction is. So the less we add more complexity to the gene pool of the monarchs, the better we're doing for them. We also don't know how knowledge transfer works. We don't know how one generation teaches the next about where to go. We don't even know if that's what happens. Um, and we also don't know how different species, how different populations respond to captive rearing. So, you know, if we've learned something, oh, great, it's possible to do with monarchs. But if it's possible to do with native swallowtails, should we be doing it with native swallowtails? We don't really have these answers. So using these um, tools as education and outreach is very powerful. And in that case, you're really just rearing maybe five or six individuals and releasing them. And as far as we know, that kind of release does not have a long-term impact on the populations. Um, but if you're trying to do it once again as a conservation action, getting like a whole school to raise a bunch of butterflies and release them into the wild, there's, there's a lot more things to consider there. Um, and really at the end of the day, it is another one of those sort of one-sided solutions. And I would say it's very half-baked as well. Half-baked because we don't know enough about Lepidoptera to say that this is for sure gonna help. And it's one-sided because we're really just focusing on like, oh, well, if there's less butterflies out there, we'll just make more butterflies, where we really ought to be focusing on, well, if there's less butterflies out there and we make more butterflies, what are these butterflies going to eat? 
we need stuff for them to go to. We can't just have the same lawns and then just keep releasing more and more butterflies. <laughs> They're not going to have anywhere to go. <laughs>